Life is often described as one big blank canvas, a canvas that you can add depth and color to. One of the best ways to do that is try something new and different. It can change your perspective on some of the things you do day to day. Now, let's say you want to add a little color to your life. It's pretty easy to do. Give it a try. You know, a trend I'm really excited about these days is repurposing objects. Repurposing objects for, well, the purpose of fence art. That's what we're doing here today. You see, what we had here is a lackluster privacy fence. You know, the standard type. How can you turn this underutilized asset into something that you're actually gonna enjoy looking at? What I love about fence art is that you can do it any time of the year. It's perfect for that period of time just before spring when you can't really get out there and plant something, but you wanna do something creative in the garden. So you may ask yourself, what sorts of things can you use when you're doing fence art? Well, anything goes. For instance, here we've used some frames. Here's some garden tools, a sculpture that was found in the garage. My friends had it in there, it hadn't been used. I said, let's pull it out and put it on your fence. The thing you want to do is you want to use things that can withstand being outdoors. It's also an opportunity to hang plants, framed plants. I framed this beautiful little agave. It's a perfect little picture here on the wall. Hey, and don't forget about our little feathered friends. You can even mount a birdhouse on the wall. Like I said, there's so many things you can use. Well, that can be a problem because if you start putting a lot of stuff on the wall, it's not gonna to hang together very well if the colors and the shapes and so forth aren't harmonious. So what I suggest is you come up with a color palette. What we did here is we chose two colors of green that work nicely with this sort of brownish fence. We have sort of an avocado green and a darker kind of army green. It's a subtle display across the back of this part of the yard. Now, we used all kinds of things to hang these. Very simple, actually. Some nails, some wire, some picture hangers, the sorts of things that you would use on the inside of the house. However, here, we used wire, screws, nails that are used for exterior work. So keep that in mind. As you can see, the view from the porch has certainly been improved. So after the show, why don't you go out in your garage and look around and come up with some things that well, you can use to create your own fence art masterpiece. Alternative bouquets, tastier strawberries, and vegetarian cooking are just around the corner. I'm always looking for interesting ways to use plants. And an interesting way to use a plant often starts with an interesting plant. What we have here is a collection of Echeverias and Sempervivums, which are kind of in the succulent family. Uh, they're very easy to grow. They require very little water. But what we're going to do with them is create a bouquet. You're not gonna go out and cut these in the garden like you might a bouquet of roses. This idea, I know, is a little bit of a mind stretch. But if you wanted to do a really funky sort of bridles made bouquet, this is the ticket because these plants I think are so cool. If you want to start with um, a plant like this and just take the soil off of it gently. You just want to put it in the water like this, tease the soil away just like that. Once the soil has been removed, you're ready to get this new and unusual idea up and going. All right, so there's the plant. Now here's one that's been completely washed off and dry. You wanna take a heavy gauge of wire, and what you'll do is you'll take and stick the wire through 
not the roots here, but the sort of base of the plant in this area here. So let's just watch this. I'm going to push it through here like that. I've got about an inch and a half of wire in this case, and I'm going to bend it down like this. There you go. Now what I'm going to do is take just some floral tape, and I'm going to start the floral tape at the top, right up against the base of the plant, and I'm just going to roll it around like this, where it overlaps ever so slightly and comes down the stem. And this will actually protect the little roots. It'll keep the plant from drying out. And actually, after the big day, if it's a wedding, or after you're finished with the arrangement or bouquet, you can disassemble this and replant these little plants. All right, so there you go. So as you can see, I've already been underway with getting lots of these flower stems prepared. So now it's just a matter of arranging the bouquet. I'm gonna start with this large one, and I'm just gonna to begin to group them and cluster them together very tightly, like this. You can see it's fairly even all the way around. And now all I would do is take the wire stems and bend them up to get the desired length of the stem of the bouquet, and then go back to the floral tape and just bind all of them together with the floral tape. Once you have the floral tape all the way down, you would just simply take ribbon and wrap it around the stem of this as you would with a floral bouquet. And then you could add flowers to this if you like. Just a unique way to use these marvelous and interesting plants. We're putting our taste buds to the test when Garden Style returns. Over at the Rutgers Earth Center, they're always growing new types of fruits and veggies for the world to try. My friend Bill Lubick shares some of their latest work with me. You know, Bill, when you mention the word strawberry, you really get people's attention. People love strawberries. Yeah, that's one of the reasons that we concentrated on doing some work with strawberries, especially looking for better flavored strawberries with a higher sugar content and with a good sugar acid balance. Mm -hmm. So our work here at the New Jersey Ag Experiment Station is really concentrating on berries that taste great. You know, these berries aren't for shipping. They're for your backyard and they're for local small farmers to be able to grow the very best strawberries that they can and not use a lot of pesticides, yeah. you know, to try yeah. to have something that stays healthy. Well, Bill, I see about five long rows of strawberries out here and how many different varieties are you trialing? We're actually testing 10 different varieties that we've had really good luck with. Um, and this is towards the end of our first uh, set of trials. We uh, do a taste test analysis where we'll bring in our students and colleagues and everyone around and, and they get <laughs> a chance a, that's to- That's a popular exercise. Yeah, it's, a, sure. it's a tough thing to do, you know? <laughs> but they've got to test the strawberries and then give us feedback on everything from the sugar to the overall flavor to the acid balance. Mm. And the acid balance is just as important as the sugar because that gives you that tartness along with the sweetness, which actually gives you the ideal strawberry. Mm. Here's a berry, that's a nice looking berry there. Now, do you notice something different about that berry? It's not the usual shape of a no, berry. No, it's more like a Christmas light bulb. Yeah, very high in the sugar content, mm. but also because of the way the architecture of the plant and the way that it sets its berries out, mm. it actually has better disease resistance. Oh, yeah. And we're finding that this may work in or on organic farms and even for home gardeners. And it tends to keep well too, but the sugar content on that is just amazing. Mm, let me try it. Mm, wow, that is one sweet berry. You'll notice too the open architecture of the plant yep. comes out and it's open more. Mm. So that allows, sun in there to allows the, the sun to come in mm. and allows better air circulation so you get better control of disease problems. Ways to experiment in the garden and the kitchen coming up. If one of your problems is dealing with limited space, you'll want to definitely try out this next gardening idea. You know, I love to go to places and find new ideas. I'm here at the Garfield Park Conservatory. Lots of people here today enjoying this beautiful place in Chicago. 
But you know, what's so interesting about this, and I want to share this with you because it's a great problem solver, is that this is a wall of plants. Why a wall of plants? Well, in this case, they're hiding a building that is sort of a visual eyesore. You see, what you have here is a beautiful representation of Monet's garden at Giverny. There's lots of school kids here today to take a look at it. But what I want to do is not only give you a glimpse of this garden, but show you how they've cleverly hidden this building. It doesn't really fit the design, and so they've done this wall of plants that you can actually do in your own home. Now let's talk about the mechanics and the fundamentals of it before we get to the plants, which that's the part I really love. If you look closely, you'll see there's a series of these units, and each unit has 16 pockets for planting. These extend about 10 inches out from the wall, and there's a drip line that runs across the top here, and here, and here, and here. And there's a slow drip of water and fertilizer that feed these plants. They're packed in with a potting soil, one blended for container gardening, and then there's a filter fabric or landscape fabric that helps hold those into place. This is a south-facing wall so they get plenty of light which will dictate the type of plants that you choose to plant here. It's a living wall, and what they've used here to enliven this wall are these beautiful pink dragon wing begonias and this carex called frosty curls. And then over here is this lovely gara with its ethereal pink blooms, and then even vegetables growing here. But one of the benefits of having a living wall like this against a building is it helps cuts down on the amount of radiation and heat buildup in the building. If you do this, you're going to want to make sure that you mount this wall on something that's very sturdy and solid, something that can take moisture. Probably a wood wall wouldn't work unless there's a nice space between it so you can get plenty of air circulation. If you don't have a lot of space, gardening on the vertical like this, it's the deal. Give it a try. We'll head to Memphis for a different approach to protein just after the break. If you've ever wanted to experiment with a vegetarian diet, you'll want to definitely check out this recipe from my friend Amy Lawrence. Amy, I've tried lots of different kinds of uh, meat substitutes, but this one sounds fantastic. Oh, thank you. We use it in all kinds of stuff, tamales, meatballs. You can use it just about any way you would, say, ground beef. You right? really can. Oh, super. Now, what are we going to start with? Here? Okay, we're going to start with the mushrooms. I'm going to roughly chop these, okay. and we're going to add them to the food processor. Okay, that's my job. <laughs> okay, there we go. And I'll take these over. It's about three cups. We have four nice-sized portobellas here. Okay. Ready to go in the food processor? Yes. All right. Oh, these smell great. Don't they? they have such a wonderful sort of earthy aroma. There we go. All right. All right. And we want to pulse those. So what size do you want the mushrooms to become? I think about the size of a black-eyed pea would be good. It's looking pretty close to me. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. Didn't want to overdo them. All right, we'll pop this off. All right. All right, and now this goes on the paper, right? Yes. Okay. We can spread it out it's on the paper. It's a beautiful paste. What's next? Okay, next we are going to use the eggplant. Okay. So we're going to roughly chop the eggplant. Okay. So where did this recipe come from? Well, when you don't eat meat when you're vegetarian. Mm -hmm. You really have to find some substitutes. Scouring every source you can. Yes. <laughs> and we prefer to have something that really is more natural than meat substitutes you can buy in the store or, you know, get sure, in the freezer right, at the make store. Make your own like we're doing today. Exactly. So, Amy, how many eggplant does this take? Uh, one large eggplant is fine. You need about three cups. One, okay, all right, we're set. And as far as the size of the pieces, about the same as we did with the mushroom? Yes. That looks pretty good there. What do you think? Yeah, I think we're ready. Okay. So we'll take that and we'll put it with the mushrooms on the sheet. Now, is this something that you and Justin make ahead of time and keep, keep on hand? 
Um, you know, we usually make it on the spot and whatever we make with it, we'll, we'll freeze, you know, whatever dish that we're making with it and that's usually how we use Excellent. it. Okay. All right, so two ingredients. Mm -hmm. Several more to go. Yes, we've got the onion. Um, we'll go ahead and chop that. Okay. It should be two cups. And so, so we will... one nice size onion. You're using yellow onion, of course. Yes. Okay. All right, ready for the onions? Here we go. Same size. Yeah, that looks great. Now we're gonna get a little messy. Are you ready? I am all about messy. Okay. It's fun. <laughs> This is vegetarian bouillon, okay. and so we're just gonna crumble it all over the top. Evenly distributing it? Yes. Okay. This is a quarter cup olive oil. Two tablespoons of balsamic vinegar. And I like that because it gives it a little sweetness you know, that you wouldn't expect. Sure. One teaspoon of garlic powder. And then the last thing that we have, just a little cracked black pepper, one eighth teaspoon. Now, we gotta mix already. it, we oh, gotta mix this it. Is the fun okay, part. you ready? We want it to, to get it as thinly spread out as possible. Mm -hmm. We wanna thinly spread it over the whole baking sheet because that'll help it cook very nicely, mm -hmm. evenly. Right, right up in the corners. Yeah, that's looking good. Look at that, okay. Okay. Ready okay. to pop it in the oven? We are, let's put it in a 350 degree oven. Mm -hmm. We will bake it for 20 minutes. You don't have to turn it, it's just all set. Looks like cooked ground beef. It really does, doesn't it? It's got a marvelous aroma. Look at this, it's so gorgeous. Oh, it's our 20 minute tamales. There's mushroom meat in that, and they really just take no time to make. Yeah, is this featured in your cookbook? It is, it's in the Southern Vegetarian. We also have a blog, The Chubby Vegetarian, with new recipes. I love it, it's fantastic. It's a Thank great you. resource. Thanks for having me, may I jump into that? Yes, yes, <laughs> I would love for you to try it. Mm-hmm. There's more garden style just after the break. Well, I hope today's show has given you, well, some food for thought. You know, trying new things broadens our horizons and makes life more enjoyable. I hope you'll try some of these recipes. And if you do, I'd love to hear about them on my Facebook page. Until next time, for Garden Style, I'm Alan Smith. Now I have a lunch date with some hot tamales. I could use on the inside of the house. However, the only difference here is that the wires we chose and the nails and so forth are those that are actually Oops. It honestly tastes like beef. Wow. That is fantastic. Oh, I'm so glad you like it. Mm. Alan, we didn't shoot the beauty show. Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> this is a beauty shot to me. I think, I think we, uh, we, we should do a montage of every time I say that when you say goodbye to the <laughs>